So it's a great pleasure today to have Daniela Ranzetti here, and he's going to talk about asymptotic Einstein equations and celestial symmetries. Well, thank you very much for the kind invitation and the opportunity to uh, uh, give a seminar here. It's the first time visiting the Nutrition Institute, and uh, I'm very surprised about how nice and uh, well organized this place is. And um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about some work uh, that I've done recently in collaboration with uh, Laurent Freidel and Anna Maria Raclario, which uh, she's a postdoc at Perimeter now. And uh, uh, it's uh, so. Let me give you some motivation to begin with before I move to the outline of the talk. So we have known uh, for quite a long time that the, um, this image group of four-dimensional um, symptoms in space times is infinite dimensional. But only recently, um, we, uh, people have made a connection, in particular to the work of Andy Strominger, between this uh, infinite group of symmetries and, um, and soft theorem, so uh, properties of, uh, of the scattered amplitudes in the infrared. And this is what uh, has been dubbed as uh, this infrared triangle. In part slides, please. So the other slides are not showing up. Oh. Yeah, there should be like next steps of this in the same slide. I, I can uh, close and open again. It won't help because there is no stuff. So you're saying the yeah, yeah, there would be this one yeah, they only should the first uh, build. Uh, okay. Is this the one that you sent to me? <laughs> Sent as a PDF. It is a PDF. It's not a slide. And you're saying more. Yeah. Ah, there you go. Maybe the Adobe reader is not showing those uh, <clears throat> for some reason. It doesn't matter if they if it doesn't have all the steps that uh, like this. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, it's just just check that the uh, if it's working there. Yeah, it's, it's switching slide. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, in particular, so what people um, have discovered is that uh, the factorization properties of scattering amplitudes uh, when you send um, one of the external graviton to zero energy imply. Uh, the conservation laws of an infinite number of, um, of charges, which are associated with this um, infinite dimensional symmetry group of null infinity. And uh, I want to make, uh, 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 let me just uh, avoid confusion uh, for the rest of the talk. I'm only going to talk about four dimensional gravity at the classical level, so um, a three level case. Uh, several aspects of the results I'm going to present can be uh, probably extended uh, to go beyond the three level case and also maybe. Beyond uh, to go to higher dimension, but all I'm going to talk about uh, the rest of the talk it's for the classical two level case. Okay, so uh, keeping this in mind, um, the first instance of this correspondence was discovered um, uh, at the leading order by relating the binaries of graviton theorem, which dates back to the mid 60s, with the BMS over translation symmetry, which uh, curiously enough, maybe and also was uh, discovered at around the same time. And, but only basically 50 years later, um, the connection was made, you know, the equivalence between these two um, uh, statements uh, about uh, scattered amplitudes and symmetries of uh, symmetric flat space times. Then, um, since uh, uh, people had proposed a, a, a new extension of the EMS group, uh, in particular, they are, uh, they are allowed for local Lorentz transformations, the natural question was, is there an analog soft uh, graviton theorem associated to this uh, new set of symmetries. And in fact, what was discovered is that there is a new uh, soft graviton theorem. Uh, this was the work of uh, 
Kashash and Strominger that uh, related these new symmetries uh, introduced by Barnish and Trossard uh, to this uh, sublim uh, scattering amplitude of the Okay, uh, but then since they, in, they uh, while they discovered the sublim of Gardentino, they also realized that there is an extra uh, sublim order in this uh, factorization properties. The natural question is. Is there a new class of symmetries that should correspond to the sub sub of Gaidon theorem? So this is uh, this was an open question until recently, and at the same time, in celestial holography, which is a reformulation of um, the scattering problem, uh, where uh, instead of using the momentous space uh, basis, people uh, use an asymptotic boost eigenstates states uh, basis. What uh, uh, people discover is there is an infinite tower of soft theorems, and uh, surprisingly, they are governed by a symmetry which is a W1 infinity structure, which has a W1 infinity structure. These, um, there, there was some evidence for, for this uh, algebra coming from uh, um, string, the uh, ambitry uh, string and self dual gravity. But if we do expect that this is actually a symmetry of the gravitation of a space in a full GR, we need to find a, a, a space-time interpretation for these uh, higher dimensional symmetries that was discovered in celestial holography. So the, um, the plan of the talk is basically to divide in three parts. In the first part of, uh, of my seminar, I try to, um, uh, I will introduce a symmetry argument in order to organize the gravitational phase space and infinity in a simple compact form and to get some guidance from, uh, from the symmetry of uh, the symmetry group of the infinity and to, um, to construct some charges which are finite and uh, they have a, a, a finite action on the symptotic shear. Then I will use this action, the second part of the two, to uh, basically to provide uh, an interpretation for this sub sub list of Gravion theorem as the conservation law for the new charges that one can uh, uh, one has at asymptotic infinity. And in the third part uh, um, of the talk, I will uh, generalize this construction to higher spin, so going beyond spin two, and uh, and provide evidence that in fact this W one infinity loop algebra. Uh, is canonically represented in the gravitation of this space. So this is the, the outline of the talk. And um, let me start with the, the uh, review of the uh, Bondi uh, coordinates, Bondi construction, uh, parameterization by infinity. So let me introduce uh, Bondi coordinates, which contains uh, the retarded time U that labels uh, outgoing uh, null uh, uh, twist free geodesics uh, at infinity. Then there is R, which is, uh, which is the coordinate along the null geodesics, and uh, basically labels the radius of the sphere. And then I have this sigma A, which are the two coordinates tangent to the sphere. So if you, if you use these coordinates, uh, I want to show that uh, the a genetic asymptotic effect space time can be parameterized in this form here. And then um, uh, one, uh, where in this metric, one has imposed this bonding gauge conditions uh, here. So some of the, uh, the components of the metric have been built, and there is this condition on the determinant of the true sphere metric that uh, one imposes. And on top of this, then there are boundary conditions that one can impose. And this is really where the symmetry group, uh, uh, the restriction, the symmetry group uh, comes from. So the re the, I, I put here in color the original boundary conditions that uh, Bondi Sachs must have proposed. The, uh, from which they discovered the BMS group. And here are the, uh, this more relaxed set of boundary conditions that um, I'm gonna use such that I, uh, you can reveal a bigger group of symmetry. So with these boundary conditions, then uh, one can uh, study, uh, uh, do an asymptotic expansion of these uh, uh, metric functions that appear here. So the first one is this uh, capital Phi. And in red, I'm, um, I'm pointing out the quantities which uh, are, appear at order one over R in the metric, and that will have like a physical relevance uh, later on. So the first one is the famous uh, Bondi mass here. Then there is this uh, upsilon A uh, core, uh, component of the metric. And here at order one over R, there is this angular momentum, curly PA, denoted here, that appears. There are different conventions for this core PA. I've chosen one which I will, uh, will become clear in a moment why I've chosen this convention. Uh, otherwise, one will have different coefficients for these three terms according to which convention one can use. 
And then in the, um, so in the two sphere metric, there may be, so there is a term which here in blue is, this is the shear, the, the shear of the null geodesics, uh, the asymptotic shear of the null geodesics. But the one of our term, uh, again, as the angular momentum and body mass is this object here, TAB, which is a, a spin two ten, uh, symmetric tensor, uh, ten, 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 a trace less tensor um, that appear in the metric and that will play the role of the spin two charge uh, that will be responsible eventually of the sub sub of gravity theory. So all I'm, I, I want to say is that this is a natural object in the same order as the more well-known uh, bondi mass and bondi angular momentum, but uh, uh, it's, it is there and it, uh, we, as we'll see, it has an important role. Okay, so this is the metric parametrization. Now, um, let me introduce the BMS group. So the BMS group is the group of uh, um, residual diffeomorphisms that preserve the bond gauge fixing, I showed you before, and this more relaxed set of boundary conditions. And the vector fields that generate this group are written here. So there, there are three uh, constituents in this uh, vector field. The first one is, this is the T. Here is a function of the coordinate on the sphere and it labels the super translation. Now in blue, you, we have this W, which is also a free function of the sphere coordinates, or uh, time independent, both T, W, and Y. And uh, this labels um, basic uh, super boost, so conformal rescaling of the of the metric. And then there is this uh, uh, YA, this uh, two D vector fields, which labels the diffeomorphism of tangent to the sphere. So this the group generated by these vector fields has this semi-direct product structure here. There is a homogeneous subgroup which is the diff S cross the the binary scaling, which both act on the normal subgroup, which is the super translations. So the important role of this subgroup is that it will uh, 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 help us to uh, classify uh, uh, the relevant physical quantities in terms of their physical pro the transformation properties. In particular, so the, the objects of physical relevance will be functionals of the metric. And in order to compute their, the way they transform under this group, best the one uses the, the, the demand that the lead derivative of the metric components can be written this form. So from this demand, then one can read off the, uh, the transformation properties of these uh, functionals of the metric phi i. And the, the primary fields of this subgroup uh, HS are labeled by two numbers. This is a conformal dimension delta and a, and a speed S. These are two numbers. And the definition of a primary field um, for this HS, this homogeneous subgroup, is this one. So the, the transformation property under only uh, the, special, the tangent diffus and the virus scaling takes this form. So it's an homogeneous transformation with this uh, uh, conformal dimension spin that determine basically the, the conformal weight uh, for the, the binary scaling of the quantity. So uh, this, uh, uh, this S also labels basically the, the numbers of uh, uh, indices that we have. Uh, it, uh, we choose the convention where positive S corresponds to form, uh, uh, form in uh, indices and negative S like to tensor indices. And this bracket here denotes the symmetrization and traceless condition, because all the quantities of interest are symmetric and traceless, so it's convenient to introduce a notation for it. So with these definitions, then one can classify which are the primary fields under this uh, uh, homogeneous subgroup of BMS, uh, BMSW. And what, what one can find is that, so uh, for different values of depth and S, uh, these are the, the objects that transform homogeneously. So some of them we've seen them before. We, we have here the, the, the covariant, the, this is what we call the covariant angular momentum exactly because it has this property that it transforms homogeneously. So not all the definition that people have used in the literature have this property. That's why we call it this covariant angular momentum. There is the, the uh, this is the, the shear. Uh, also, uh, uh, I have to specify, this is a property at a specific cat, cat u equals zero of cross crime. So the, the shear at the u equals zero transform, transforms also homogeneously. Then we see that the, the news, which is the time derivative of the shear itself, does not transform homogeneously, but you can shift the news by an object which is called the Gerov tensor, and this which is defined by this condition here. And this combination, this shift in news, is um, homogeneous under these transformations. J, uh, so this curly n is uh, the second time derivative of the, sh of the shear. So it's uh, basically uh, n dot. 
JA is a, a, an energy current density that will appear in a moment in the equation of motion and has this form. And then there is this, uh, so this is the, uh, these two masses. So the first mass is a covariant mass, which is a shift of the bonding mass. The bonding mass itself does not transform homogeneously. But if you add this piece, now this combination does, and there's a second object that one can construct that transforms homogeneously, which is the so-called dual mass, the dual covariant mass, which was uh, introduced by Chris and uh, Godazar, the two Godazar, and has this form here. This is uh, like a, if you want, a topological charge, and this epsilon is the complex structure of the two sphere, and the definition of the charge uh, is this one. And these are all the objects uh, at uh, conformal dimension three that have this property of transforming homogeneously. Um, can, can you just go back to the previous slide? The the, the thing, uh, yeah. So that that object, that, that sort of script, TAB, is yeah. very, so that's not to be confused with your Tor AB of the next. Tau, no, yeah. No, 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 no. Tau is the Gerald tensor. It's a different thing. Tau, if you want, is something that um, goes to CAB. Or the, the time derivative of the new tensor. It's a shift of the new tensor. So, so how was the, was that the, now back to the to the later slide? Yes. Uh, can you see the um, so Tor AB is the Gerog tensor. Mm -hmm. And it, how is it defined? Um, uh, it's basically it's a function of the of the sphere metric Q and is defined as a solution if you want of this equation. Oh, I see the solution. So it's a 2 d CFT. Yeah, it's like basically the, the you can write it as a Vilasoro stress tensor. And for this spin to field, primary field, I thought there, there should be some like unitarity bound for the uh, mass of uh, this operator, right? For this primary operator. Uh, so the unitarity bound for, I mean, this which dimension, the conformal dimension? Yeah, yeah, yeah conformal dimension. Yeah, these are all these are all objects with conformal dimension three. Uh, so I order one over R, the quantity uh, in the metric expansion, the, the, the object that transform obviously uh, they all have uh, conformal dimension. Well, three. Actually, I'm just saying like there is this primary the first primary field it has been two, and the conformal dimension is one. And uh, I thought there should be some kind of utility bound for the conformal dimension for a certain spin, right? For every spin. Yeah, there is a relation basically. You can uh, assign you satisfy that you already bound, like that, that is satisfied. I thought, like, for example, I thought stress tessa, which, which has spin two, it should have uh, for dimension two. Yeah. But uh, this is dimension one, right? Uh, no, tau uh, is, is this CAB. I'm just passing. CAB is not a, it's not a complex stress test. It's not a primary. It's a primary, but it's not a stress tensor interpretation. The stress tensor interpretation is tau b, which in fact has conformal dimension two minus two. And tau, uh, tau uh, this curly tab, it does not have a uh, stress tensor interpretation as far as I know. So, but if you want, the bound comes from the fact that once you assign a given dimension to the metric, then uh, you can look at uh, the way it appears in the metric expansion. And then you can determine the conformal dimension of uh, of the of the quantity through the the spin. So can I ask yeah. a question? So in the usual way, these um, asymptotic symmetries are formulated. They only talk about the super translation and super rotation, right? So mm -hmm. t sigma and y sigma. So where where do you get the y scaling? Uh, the yeah, value scaling, okay, so the value scaling is because, okay, what usually um, what is done, uh, what has been done before is uh, to uh, impose a restriction in this W such that the, um, the, um, the scale uh, of the sphere is, uh, is constant. Namely, you, can, you cannot rescale the, the determinant of the, of the sphere metric. Okay. So that's that's like Q equals zero. That it's like a choice that you make. Oh. And you can achieve that if you set this um, W to be equal to uh, the divergence of, of Y. Uh -huh. So by imposing the restriction, you, you fix the scale of the sphere metric. But if you allow that to be uh, to fluctuate, then you have an extra uh, free parameter in your group, uh -huh. uh, symmetry group, which is this W. Okay, so now, uh, 
now, okay, but as I was saying, this is just the transformation properties under this homogeneous uh, subgroup. Now, if we restore super translations, these quantities that I showed before don't, trans don't transform homogeneously. So the question is, what are the combinations of these primary fields and the derivatives that such that we obtain, again, an homogeneous transformation under the full uh, EMS topic? And basically, the answer to this question is, well, those are the Eisen equations. So in order to have a compact uh, formulation, let me introduce these automorphic frames, M and F bar, with this renormalization. And you can write the, the sphere metric and this uh, the volume form, the epsilon B, in terms of these uh, automorph automorphic, automorphic, automorphic frames. And then um, let's uh, switch from the notion of spin to the notion of elicity, because both MA and M bar A have a conformal dimension of one and a spin one, uh, sorry, conformal dimension of zero and spin one. So let aside let assign an elicity to uh, MA and uh, equal plus one and an elicity minus one to M bar. So then now we can convert that spin as tensors into scalars of a given elicity. Okay, the way to do it is. Uh, you have a, a, an object uh, with uh, some uh, tensor indices, you contract them with, with, with M or with M bar, and then you assign this elicity in, uh, integer number S or minus S according to which is if it's M bar or M. So this is the way you, uh, we can go from uh, uh, spin as tensors to scalars with a given elicity, and then things becomes very compact. You see, you can now introduce a scalar for the shear, scalar for the shift in news, the time derivatives of it and all the objects that, that I showed you before. And importantly, uh, uh, let us also introduce this complex mass, this notion of complex mass, which is a linear combination of the mass times I, the, the dual mass, which is going to, uh, uh, play, the, uh, is going to play a role in the, uh, for the super, uh, for the leading soft theorem. And these Cartan derivatives also, which are the, defined as the contraction of the, uh, uh, the Cartan derivative with these holomorphic anti-homorphic anti -homorphic frames. So this is a bit of convent or notation I need to introduce, but the, the price that we may have gained by doing that is that now the Einstein equation take a very simple form. So for any of you who have seen the Einstein equation as a infinite Einstein equation on the frame, you will recognize that this is, for instance, for the angular momentum, you will have two lines here instead of a special. So let's see what, what's going on here. So this is just, okay, this is the first equation is telling us that the time derivative of, the, of this energy current is related to this uh, curly M, right? But then the, uh, the real, um, the meat is in the last three equations. So the first one, this is the bonding mass loss formula written in terms of this uh, covariant complex mass. There is a first contribution, which is this current contribution. And then there is a, a hard piece in these equations, which is the quadratic term here. And one can assure this is as basic as an interpretation, as a balanced law for, um, for the super translations, and is equivalent to the leading soft theory. Then we have the evolution equation for the covariant momentum, which again has a, a, a soft term and a hard term. And this also has an interpretation as a flux balanced law for the, uh, for the super rotations, which is equivalent to the sub leading soft and there is a third equation, which also appears at the same order in one of our expansion, which is the time evolution for this uh, spin tube uh, uh, elicity scalar here, which takes this form. And what I'm going to show you is that one can understand this uh, balance equation as um, associated to a new symmetry, which is a spin tube symmetry, and is equivalent to the sub sub of T. So this, if you want, is the summary of the first two thirds of my talk. You, you only contract either with all M's or all M bars. Is that, you don't have mixed uh, you, objects. It, uh, yeah, so uh, I mean, you like the C, for example, and then you've got the C bar would be the complex conjugate. Yes. Uh, yes. But, but you don't have a thing with a C contracted with an M and an M bar. No, that would be zero because these objects are also symmetric. Oh, and, and did you say traceless? And traceless, yes. Um, so yeah, it's, this is the CZZ and CZ bar, Z bar, basically, the two components of the shear. Yeah. Okay, so 
let's um, let's see how these work. Let's start with the um, first of all. Uh, let me introduce a next layer of notation, which is uh, let me uh, label these charges by their helicity. So I call them QS, and where S now it uh, here goes from minus two to plus two, and it uh, corresponds to this. Um, to these charges, so spin zero, spin zero is the mass, spin one is the momentum, spin two is the spin two charge, and then we have this other two point equation. And we can, in this way, we can write the Einstein equation in even more common form if you want it, just like a single or recursion relation of this form here for S taking these different values. So this is basically the, the core, the key recursion relation that I'm going to use to prove the, uh, the soft theorems. And, and bench I'm going to extend it to higher speed. Now, what we need to do uh, in order to, to prove to the equivalence with the equivalence of theorem, we need to renormalize, we need to impose a boundary conditions. So the boundary condition that we're going to impose on the shift the news is that uh, basically the case at large varies uh, over time times in this way, where alpha is really fixed by which order of, uh, I want to go to. So if I want to uh, start the sub sub links of theorem, I need to take alpha at least bigger than three. And then I also need to assume that the charges will decay at u going to plus infinity. So when I go to phi plus plus, I assume that I'm decaying into a radiative vacuum, uh, but not when I go to u minus infinity. So at u minus infinity, I can have charges different from, from zero, but when I go to plus infinity, I, uh, all the charges uh, decay to zero. And this is necessary because now we want to use the constraint equation to integrate the evolution equations to write the charges as a part object in this way. And in order for this object to be finite, I need to have this uh, fall off behavior for, um, for the shift. So one can check that this is, uh, uh, is what one needs to impose in order for this object to be well defined. And then when we go to U manifest, what we need to do is an extra layer of renormalization which is, uh, which I, uh, I, I write it down here. So the mass, we don't need to do anything. This is just a constant rescaling for uh, getting rid of some uh, uh, cost of uh, number in front of the charge. Uh, however, for the momentum, I need to do a, a shift in the momentum by adding uh, U times uh, the derivative of the complex mass and the spin to charge, I need to do same thing now instead of the mass here I have the momentum and there is an extra piece which is quadratic in u and also a non-local term contribution. So this is this is the expression of these uh, uh, renormalized charges, which uh, they parametrize the non-radiative core of the space. So here at, at uh, basically at I naught, we can assume that the space phase space is defined by the condition that there is no radiation in the thing, uh, which I express as n hat equal zero. And then one can show that these are actually the charges which are preserved in time at uh, what you go to write on. So these are the, the variables that parametrize the, the corner of a space uh, at uh, I uh, ascribe uh, plus minus, which is a non radiative corner of a space. So, of course, if there is no radiation, you would expect that the charges are constant in time. And you can show if you use the evolution equation that these are the combinations such that these headed quantities are time independent. So it happens that the time independence is also the same condition that gives you renormalized charges, namely that charges which have a finite action on the gravitational phase space. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the construction of the charges. Now, so let me uh, summarize what I've done so far. I've started uh, with some approved boundary conditions. I renormalize the charges so that the, I go to the vacuum at square plus plus, and I have some uh, finite contribution at the, the square plus minus. And then I define my asymptotic symmetry generators as I am smearing these uh, char uh, charge generators with some uh, uh, functions, T labeling the sphere translations, Y the, uh, the true sphere diffeomorphism, and Z that labels the, uh, the true spin transformations. Now, in order to compute the symmetry action on the shear, which is the key object to derive the soft theorems, we need to integrate the symptotic acid equations. And when you, you integrate them, you get two contributions for the charge written as a bound object. As was mentioned earlier, there is a, a soft term, which is linear in the radiation fields. And there is a hard term, which is quadratic in or, order, uh, high orders in the, in the radiation fields. For instance, if you do this for the mass, you get these two contributions. This is the linear one, and then there is a quadratic uh, contribution. 
Now, here I've introduced this notation, uh, partial u minus one. This is a pseudo differential operator, which people used for other reasons back in the, well, in the 70s, and uh, is defined um, uh, in this way, which is somehow uh, con compatible with the boundary condition I, I, I've used. And it's going to be very, uh, very useful to have this, uh, this notation for this uh, basic integration of the try from plus infinity to u. Uh, written in terms of this self differential operator. So, in terms of this uh, object, uh, then you can write, for instance, the spin to charge. And again, you have a linear term, you have a quadratic term, but then you also start having higher order terms when you go to the spin two, uh, which is, for, uh, for instance, a term like this, which is cubic. And uh, I'm going to uh, say more about the, uh, the relevance of these higher order terms. In general, people, they always look only at the linear terms and the quadratic terms when they study some theorems. But in fact, there are these corrections that come from the non-linearity of gravity, which should be taken into account and actually can have an important role. And we'll come back to this at the end of the talk. And the last ingredient for the soft theorems is the basic, the, the, the key, uh, the basic bracket for the radius of space, which is the fact that the shear is conjugate to the, to the shift in use, where these are the, these are, this is the, uh, holomorphic component of the shear, this would be the anti-holomorphic component of the news. So this is like uh, CZZ, this would be an F at Z plus Z bar. And they have the, the conjugation relations came by this. So these are the, the key ingredients. And now we can uh, we can uh, compute the action of this as we start with the square translation. We act with this charge on the shear and we obtain this expression here. We recognize this is the, the action generated by this vector field here, uh, T partial U. And uh, we can, uh, we can. this is a, uh, what the well-known action of super translation on the shear. We can do the same thing for the super Lorentz charge. And we again write the, 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 this expression here. I would do this, uh, this, this bracket and recognize that this is uh, generated by this vector field, which is exactly these are the two vector fields that generate the nice BMS group. So, as I was saying before, this is the a subgroup of the BMSW once you restrict that this uh, free function W to be related uh, to the divergence of one. So when you impose this, you end up with the general BMS group, and this is exactly the super rotation, super uh, rotation. Uh, now, the interesting uh, new action is the one generated by the spin to charge. Yeah. So, uh, there is, uh, one can recognize that the action generated by this charge ca uh, can, uh, is uh, the one associated with a pseudo vector field, which takes this form. So, what is a pseudo vector field? Well, we can construct an homomorphic pseudo vector of spin s by, by multiplying n, m, s times m with this. Uh, uh, u minus s powers of partial u. And remember, this uh, for when this power is negative, this is this pseudo differential operator, which has a, a, a generalized notion of magnitude rule. And from this, so this is an object which has spin one, uh, sorry, uh, spin s and conformal dimension one, because here conformal dimension s, this s conformal dimension one minus s. So the whole thing is conformal dimension one and spin s. And for instance, d zero is just a standard time derivative, d one spatial derivative and D2 now contains this non-local contribution. So you see that this is a now we the combination of, of this pseudo vector of, uh, of spin S, you get this pseudo vector fields where now you have this non-local contribution in the vector field. So this is a new symmetry generated by the spin to charge, which is non-local on scry, and this is the one that it's uh, uh, the associated with this uh, sub sub layers of gravity. So how do we prove the equivalence with the soft of the soft gradient theorems? Well, let me non local term is interesting to, to have more interpretation for this. This non local term. Like I, I mean, I understand there are some library operators in couple of fields here that they are non local. Well, for instance, it's one sorry. one uh, one place where these non local objects show up. In fact, where they're very natural is in inquisitors. Uh, where you have basically uh, the fundamental object there is like this light rays, yeah. Yeah. and there th those yeah. become, that becomes local in, in the twister space, right? This object. So that's why maybe it, from the point of view of, of uh, ambidextrous string theory, this uh, W one inf uh, infinity algebra, it's uh, it's natural in a way 
because then these ambiguities of no locality somehow disappear. From the point of view of space time, uh, um, these no localities that, uh, that uh, characterize these higher spin symmetries, uh, the, the head, for instance, there, uh, I mentioned a short couple of, uh, of uh, references at the beginning of previous work on the sub sub of theorem, where um, people proposed some vector fields which were over needing in R. So these, these were vector fields which were divergent as, uh, as cry. But it turned out that the, those vector fields were giving you the charges which actually were responsible for, for the sub sub of theorem. So there's clearly like a connection between non locality in time and the mm, overleading divergences in, in R, which is probably something related to the fact that in order to go deeper in the bulk, you need to somehow go no local in time as, as cry. If you want to like to go, because going overleading in R allows you to basically go uh, further in the bulk in one of our, to pick up contribution of charge contribution, which are more subleading in the metric component. And this is somehow equivalent to like, having some no local information all over scry. So in a, a kind of holographic understanding of if you want to like uh, reconstruct the back, you need to have no local information on the one. Okay, so the, the soft theorems are basically statements where you have a, um, a, a S matrix element where you have an insertion of a soft Python here A plus minus with the two possible licities. And then you can rewrite this scattering amplitude as the S metric element without the soft gravity insertion, but with these opera differential operators which act on the uh, on this uh, S metric. And then the, the different orders they take these forms, <laughs> leading one, these are the soft factors, these uh, these operators, the lean sub leading, and this uh, so these two are the ones that were discovered by uh, Kashal and Strominger uh, recently. This was the Weinberg uh, result back in the 60s already. And um, what you do next is to do a large R mode expansion of the shear in the scrying. So you do some sort of point approximation and you rewrite the shear in terms of this creation in the operators. And this uh, basically you see that here, the plane waves, they localize on the position of the sphere along the direction of propagation. And the non locality left is only between the frequency omega and uh, the retarded time u. So with this expansion, then okay, you can check that the bracket between C and the U's, so the, the, this basic bracket that I showed you before, gives you like, the standard the commutator for the modes, for the equation relation operators. And you can parameterize the, the four moment of the massless particle. Uh, okay, we go for simplicity. Let me go to the flat retarded coordinates on the plane instead of the sphere. And if you do that, then at this how you can parameterize the four momenta of massless particles. This is like the of the graviton, and this is for momentum of the other particles, and you can parameterize the angular momentum, uh, the, polarization, the polarization tensors, and everything. In terms of this coordinate, this is just standard um, celestial safety uh, machinery, uh, what have I done? Okay. Ooh. I'm giving away. Okay, so uh, then let's introduce the Fourier modes for the neg negative particles, which uh, is this object here. And from this, we can define the soft gravitons. So these are the leading, sub leading, and sub sub leading uh, negative elicity. You can do it for positive elicity, uh, outgoing soft gravitons, they take this form in terms of this creation relation. So these are the object that enter the, if you want, the right hand side of the soft theorem. And you, the, the key uh, um, aspect of the theorem is that the, the, the soft charges, the soft components of the charges of the mass, the, the angular momentum and the spin to charge that I showed before are related to these soft uh, gravitons by just a number of special derivatives. So you already you start seeing where, how the two things are equivalent because one side of the of the soft theorem is from the, the soft theorem given by the equivalence between the soft charge and these derivatives of the soft gravitons, and then the right hand side is given by the action of the R charge on the Fox states. So you can use the bracket of the uh, part of the charges on the shear to compute the, the action on this 
fox states, uh, one particle fox states, and see that these are eigenstates for the hard part of the charges, and the eigenvalues are these operators that I show you here, doesn't have the specific form, is the fact that this. Uh, these operators eventually are going to be exactly the same factors that I uh, mentioned before. This H here are these uh, uh, conformal weights. So this is the uh, omega is the frequency, and this is plus minus two according to the density. And uh, okay, uh, uh, important thing is that for the leading subleading case, these, these uh, as I mentioned, they were not higher, higher than quadratic contribution to the hard charge. So this is their full expression. But for the cubic, for the spin two charge, there were cubic terms, which corresponds to collinear terms in this action that I didn't write here, but a priori they are there. So there are corrections to the soft terms coming from those terms that I didn't write explicitly. Okay, then uh, uh, we can now state the equivalence. So in order to have uh, the key observation of Andy uh, in 2013 was that if you want to have a well-defined scattering problem, Namely, if you want to reconstruct the, the data of square plus starting from the data square minus, you need to choose a frame as square plus and you need to choose initial values for the charges after, uh, that then you can integrate with the push equations. And then the, this was done by basically imposing these matching conditions uh, between the square plus minus and square minus, uh, square minus plus. Basically, I, I, I note if you want, that we have these anti, anti polar matching conditions where you uh, impose all this infinite number of conservation, conservation equations one per point on this. And the existence of these conservation laws imply that there are an infinite set of symmetries for the S matrix, which can be stated as the fact that these charges commute with the S matrix. So, this statement here, the fact that these charges commute with the S matrix, uh, which means that we have this infinite number of symmetries, is exactly the statement of the soft theorems. How do we see that? Well, we see this by Noticing, as I mentioned before, that for the soft charge is exactly uh, related to the soft graviton. And then if you use this crossing symmetry probability, it's just uh, uh, the fact that uh, the soft graviton acting on the out state can be related to soft graviton acting on the uh, incoming state. Uh, and this gives you the left hand side of the soft product, uh, uh, the sublime. So, yes, as I mentioned. And the fact that the hard charges are uh, basically uh, and, uh, they, so the, the single particle states are eigenstates for the hard charges give you the soft factors that you have on the left of the right hand side of the soft gravity. So, imposing this accommodation ratio of the charge with S matrix for the soft part of, uh, of the charge and the hard part of the charge gives you exactly the soft. Theory. So we have that the asymptotic as equations are equivalent to the soft gravity theorems, at least for the leading, subleading, and sub subleading order. And these soft theorems are nothing else but statements about the invariance of the S matrix under this infinite dimensional symmetry group. So I think this, uh, yeah, the last part of this uh, last thing I want to mention again is okay, so going back to these collinear contributions. So uh, the, the spin to charge can be uh, written as a quadratic contribution plus a cubic one, which takes this form here. And uh, you can see that basically um, when you compute the, the bracket uh, with, the, with the shear, it gives you two kinds of contribution. This is a creation operator contribution. And, uh, and then there's this other contribution here. These are both collinear terms that appear in the soft theorems. And you can write them more explicitly in this form. It doesn't matter exactly in the specific form. What I want to say is that there are corrections to the soft uh, theorems of the Kashas and Strominger, which comes from the nonlinearity of gravity. And these are classical corrections, three level classical correction, just higher in G Newton, Manoli and H bar. So a priori, uh, one should go back and uh, check the derivation of uh, Kashas and Strominger, where this. Uh, contribution come from. And in fact, when we talked to, uh, to Freddy with API, and we mentioned this, and he said that in fact they did uh, neglect all the collinear terms in the soft when they studied the soft theorems because they were looking at the strip amplitudes where supposedly this contact terms are not okay at all, but the they should be there. So there's a potential uh, for like matching this connection coming from gravity with the uh, diagram state emission. But, uh, okay. I'm not going to say more about this, and this. Uh, just let me uh, summarize what I've done in these first two parts of my seminar. 
So we saw that the, the symmetry principle is a very powerful tool in order to arrange the gravitational phase space and uh, reveal the existence of a spin to charge. And there's um, a clear connection between the conservation equation, the spin to charge, and the sub sub means of theta. Now, the nonlinear nature of this equation manifests itself in these corrections, uh, collinear corrections. And unlike the spin zero and the spin one symmetries, which are responsible for the leading sub leading theorems, this spin two symmetry is not a simple asymptotic diffeomorphism, but it's non local of nature. And uh, it is represented by the action of a pseudo vector field on scribe. And uh, so now the question is, can we understand this spin to chart as a, uh, one of the canonical generators of this W1 infinity symmetries that has been revealed in celestiography? And if this is the case, then uh, um, do we have uh, a gravitational understanding for, uh, is there like a gravitational uh, dynamical system that uh, allow us to represent this even tower of uh, celestial world entities uh, on the phase space of gravity. So this is the questions I, I want to address in the last part of the talk. If you have questions about the first two parts, uh, you can ask me now or later. Just a naive question. Like uh, at the beginning, you mentioned that like, uh, it's a 2 d couple field theory, and then you give a bunch of particle fields, and they all play a, a role in this. <coughs> and they, uh, I mean, uh, like, you know, they are also double twist primary object. You can control this double twist by putting this primary together, right? And this fields play any role. I mean, those probably will uh, respond to these uh, hard contributions uh, with the Bush equation. They are quadratic in the primary fields. I mean, this twist. Yeah, yeah, I, I noticed there is a Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it might be associated with uh, hard contribution in the in the charge. Okay. okay so let me uh, go to the third and last part of the seminar then. Uh, Okay, so let, let's actually go back to the, these covariance properties of the charges and uh, try to frame them in the context of uh, valid scalars, which is the natural objects to, uh, to use when we want to talk about uh, um, covariant object and infinity. So I can complete the, um, the null frame given by the two holomorphic and holomorphic frames by introducing these two extra null frames, L and N, which is the one the coordinate value the area. Form, and then the bike scalars are just the contractions of the bike tensor with those uh, these combinations of, of the null frames and they take this form here. So we can expand them now at asymptotic infinity uh, in one of the R, and this is basically just the, the pin here. So you have the, the psi four starts with the one of the R power, then you have the higher corrections, and this is associated usually with the, the output radiation strike. And then you have psi three, psi two, psi one, and then it's psi zero, which is the most interesting one here. And uh, it, it's written as um, so it, it is this infinite sum here, where this uh, psi zero s, these are all free data uh, on scribe that one of the should uh, assign to the initial data problem. And this uh, characterizes the income condition. Now, there is a, a precise relations between the covariant observables, these primary fields I mentioned earlier, and these are synthetic scalars. In particular, this is the relation that you have for S minus two to two, which means that, okay, the psi zero four, the leading term of psi zero is nothing else but this uh, curly N. The leading order of psi three is this current J. And then more interesting, we have as, uh, uh, well, psi zero two, which is just the, the combination of the mass and the combined mass, this complex mass here. Psi zero one is this uh, curly P. And then there is psi zero zero, which is the spin to charge. So we see, okay, we start seeing that these, uh, uh, these higher spin charges appear naturally at null infinity. And the, the place to look for the higher ones is clearly inside psi zero. Um, but that first one should be a Q sub minus two. I suppose. This one. No, the on the bottom line. Ah, uh, yes, yes, that's my yes, yes. And and you mean equals equals equal equal yes yes they are exactly. Uh, I mean that's why they transform nicely because they are this leading contribution to the scalars. 
In fact, I mean, that's not how we found them, but we, after like I know, doing pages of calculation, we said, of course, what else could it be, right? I mean, it's, okay, they must be the last scalars. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let's uh, push this for uh, let, let's push this a bit further, and let's uh, this is the proposal that we want to make. So we want to generalize the this relation to higher spin charges and write these general relations between the subleading contribution to the psi zero and these higher spin charges for uh, qs plus two where s is now is bigger than zero, and such that. This recursion relation, the same recursion relation that I showed before, which uh, 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 summarized the Einstein equations for the spin uh, between uh, spin s minus two to plus two, to be valid also for all spins, not just let's not stop at s equal two, but let's go to all the spins. And uh, the, so the, the, the proposal is that these higher spin charges are associated with this remaining free data on Scry. And they encode uh, this expansion mode of psi zero, and this recursion relation corresponds to somehow a truncation of the Einstein equations at subleading order in a one over R expansion. So up to S equal three, uh, as I'm, I'm saying here, this is actually exactly the Einstein equations. For S bigger than three, we know that we, there's going to be some corrections to this recursion relation, but for the purpose of uh, studying the, uh, the symmetry algebra, we argue that this is actually enough, if we, at least for the uh, linear order in the algebra, in the bracket. So this truncation less equation is the W1 infinity algebra. Okay, so this is the statement. And I'm gonna provide the two uh, piece of evidence for that statement. The first one is that the canonical action of the highest spin charges uh, on gravitons in a conformal primary basis corresponds exactly to the OP that people have studied in the spectral symmetries. And they, they, that's how this W1 infinity symmetry was revealed in the first place. And the second is even more direct evidence, which is the fact that um, these charges, they provide a canonical representation of this W1 loop, infinity loop algebra on the gravitational phase space, at, at least at the linearized order. So let me uh, just uh, um, do that. So what we need to do best, we need to redo the same uh, the same job we did for this uh, spin to charge for these higher spins. We need to define renormalized charges uh, to all orders. This K labels the, the, the order of how many uh, fields I have, like how many uh, shear fields or news fields I have in the charge. So these are like the, all the quadratic and higher contribution to the charge. And this is the generic uh, renormalization scheme for each of them. This curly QK here, these are the solution to the recursion relation and the given order in the number of oscillators. Then uh, we define the, the, the remorse charges as the limit of degree to one infinity of these guys. And the, the linear charge for a given spin is nothing but the D S plus two times derivatives of these uh, soft gravitons operator, which is defined like this. So this is the generalization of uh, to s bigger than two of what I've shown you before, the soft graviton operator at leading sub leading sub subspin order. And now we can compute the quadratic contribution of these charges, uh, uh, the, the action on the shear. So remember, this is the second piece of uh, information that we need to recall the soft theorems. So we compute the bracket of the quadratic charges of the shear. We need to use this uh, pseudo differential calculus to do that. And after some algebra, we arrive at this expression here. So this is the generic expression. <laughs> charge defined by this regression relation on the shear. And then the word identities for this highest spin charge should now correspond to the power of the was the components of that theorems. And this, in fact, can be uh, verified. So the way we can check it is that, okay, let's uh, um, use some technology of, of celestial CFT. So well, usually in celestial CFT, one goes to the Lorentz, uh, the two, uh, two choose the magic signature. About which is called Celestial uh, uh, CFT, where the normal component group is two copies of a central instead of having just a, a, a central C. Basically, the advantage of doing this is that we can treat the Z and Z bar as independent coordinates on the sphere. And then uh, the other key ingredient is the is conformal primary boost eigenstates. So you do this Mellin transform of the of the of the news, and you end up with these conformal primary boost eigenstates. 
which have the, critical, the, the crucial property that the residual and negative value, the negative integer value of this conformal dimension of the boost again value is exactly the conformally soft product. So this is the crucial area. Now with these guys, what we can do is construct the celestial of E of two of, of two of them and take the collinear limit where we just send, for instance, Z bar, uh, the difference of the two Z bar to zero, and we keep the Z, uh, Z finite. In that limit, what we have to is for E, and it takes this for me. So this is the OP for these two objects, uh, the product of two copies of this conformally primary boost against states. Um, these are beta functions here. So these are the, uh, the coefficients of the OPE. And uh, this can be, uh, so this corresponds to the same OPE that one can find from scattering amplitudes. Can, like, one can show that it can be derived from scattering amplitudes, but can also be derived from symmetry arguments, where the n equal zero contribution is the primary operator, the primary field, and all the higher contributions are all the layers of, this, of the primary field, which corresponds to the descendant of the representation of such as of SH1. Okay, so uh, from uh, from this OPE, then uh, we take uh, this conformance of limit. So we define this Q1S, which is just the special derivatives of the conformance of graviton. And by doing this conformance of soft limit, taking these derivatives, you arrive at this uh, function. This is, this is exactly the action of the quadratic charge at gen x in S on the shear. Once you go, of course, to the uh, to the to the boost basis. So what the object that I showed you before, which I derived from this recursion relation, yeah, is exactly this OPE of this. Uh, Speed uh, S guy, the components of graviton with these derivatives and the and a given conformal uh, primary field. So, this is the first piece of evidence. Now, the last piece of evidence comes from the uh, so, what, what people did in celestial is now to take double twice the conformal limit and introduce, uh, use this light transform uh, to introduce this W currents to derive this bracket from the OPE that I showed you earlier. This OP of the conformal primary uh, conformals of gravitons. And this is the uh, this is the wedge of some algebra of W1. So what is this restriction on the both? Uh, so this was uh, the CFT uh, relation. And uh, what we can do is to uh, study the bracket uh, of charges. At the order, so we only look at Q2, Q1 contributions. And uh, again, after some algebra, we arrive at this expression here. For uh, here, I introduce the smear charges. So I'm smearing this uh, charge aspects with some uh, S, which to give in a given representation of the C. And if you then uh, uh, use this fact, this information to do a mode expansion of this house, you can go from this uh, expression of the bracket to this one here, modes. And you recover after some translation of M and then R, uh, the W1, the W1 infinity loop algebra, where a priori you don't need any restriction on this, uh, uh, this restriction from above on this uh, coefficient uh, N and M, which means that we don't see the, the need for a wedge algebra restriction, at least at the initialized charge bracket. But, anyways, this is the first, the last piece of evidence I'm going to present. That these high spin charges, in fact, they provide a canonical representation for this W1 symmetry algebra. Okay, so let me summarize. So, what we see is that we propose a set of evolution equations for high spin charges, which are supposed to encode the dynamics of uh, ice and gravity at this a truncated level for uh, an order in one of the ice functions. Like new non local symmetries which are associated with observed vector fields. The action of the quadratic configuration of this asymptotic uh, of these charges on the asymptotic shear reproduce exactly the OPE between the soft charges and the conformal private, uh, primary gra graviton operators in celestial safety. And to linear order in, uh, in the bracket, the W1 loop algebra has a canonical realization in the gravitational phase space in terms of the Poisson brackets of these charges. 
Uh, now, there are, of course, uh, many other directions to go. Two I want to point out is the fact that the relevance of this regression relation uh, for S bigger than three has to be uh, in the sense of uh, how encodes the vacuum Western equation if uh, it was or R should be studied more uh, clearly and established more firmly. And the second one is that, of course, one needs to go beyond the mean order. We have uh, evidence, I mean, we have explicit equation that the, at the quadratic order, if you impose the, uh, the wedge restriction, you will see and uh, recover the other one structure. And uh, what the conjecture at this point is, is that if you want to relax the wedge restriction, you need to include in cubic terms contribution as well for, to the quadratic algebra. So these higher contributions that people don't consider usually in SSFT or in, uh, in the soft theorems are actually very important to preserve the structure of the algebra if you want to relax the, the wedge some algebra restriction. Okay, thank you very much. So. Do you see any possibility of getting the uh, the big W one plus infinity algebra arising if you look at higher order stuff or something? Uh, probably that's something that uh, we'll have to do with quantization. Yeah, that. that would be. I mean, well, if one can establish firmly that at the at least uh, at the classical level. This is realized, this hardware is realized, then the one can take that as, a, if you want, as an ansatz for the quantization. Say, okay, say the quantum theory is defined as the quantization of this algebra, which is what you guys have been studied, uh, studying long ago. And, it, and there will be a non perturbative quantization. Without, you don't have to like look at one loop, loop, so the, so this is the definition of my quantum theory of gravity at the asymptotic infinity. And that's the power of symmetry. Once you have the symmetry, then uh, you can quantize it uh, immediately. I think usually, I mean, when people say that this full tower of higher spin charges can be generated using just the leading subleading and sub subleading uh, mm -hmm. charges yeah is that the case in, in, in your uh, yeah yeah you see that um, the, the, the statement is related to the fact that uh, if you have a spin one and spin zero then you don't need any higher spin to close the algebra, right? Because when you do the bracket of the spin one with spin one, you end up with a spin one object. Right? But as soon as you introduce a spin two, spin two is spin two, it's not a spin two object, it's a spin three object. So you need to, once you, if, if, once you allow for the spin two, then you have this infinite tower of uh, higher spin charges that you need to uh, introduce you know, if you want to close the, yeah, I mean, like you can, uh, you can study the, the Poisson brackets of, uh, of the highest spin charges using this uh, uh, issue here. And you, uh, but I mean, it's easy to see. I mean, if you have uh, I mean, the Poisson bracket, uh, what it does is that it, it, it brings the, the order of spin two, spin two, who go down by one, who would end up with spin three object. So you need to uh, you need to include all the highest spin objects. So once you have the spin two, it's uh, uh, right. Yeah, but but I mean, in the last slide, you had some uh, comment on uh, establishing. I mean, understanding this uh, higher spin uh, charges from mm -hmm. uh, you know, higher, R. I mean, one over R expansion. The I'm talking about the last to last. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So what you know what I'm saying is yeah, I, I didn't understand that. Oh, okay. So here, what I mean is that uh, um, you can explicitly check that. Let me go back to the proposal. If you, with this identification, 
of the charges in the subplane in terms of size zero. And uh, um, the, the Yankee identities in the human pair formalism, for instance, that Newman Perls wrote in these papers of Fix C8. You can derive the Einstein equations in terms of these charges. And they did explicitly the calculation for size zero uh, three, sorry, size zero one. So they computed size zero one dot equal blah, blah, blah. And you can check that if you identify size zero one with the QS3, uh, yeah, QS3, then this recursion ratio is exactly the, is implied by the Einstein equations written in terms of the device scanners. There are no extra terms. What they did uh, was to actually go to also to size zero two, and they wrote down what is size zero two dot. And there you see that this is there, this contribution is there, but the I heard the contributions that, that appears, but you can check that at least if you stay in the same elicity sector, those I order terms don't affect the bracket, the, the linear bracket. So this is, so far it's cons the, 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 the proposal is consistent with the, so we know this is a truncation. There are, if you go to spin I then three, you will have other terms, but for the bracket, at least a linear order, it, they don't contribute. So the statement so far is consistent. Then of course it's a matter of, especially if you want to go to the mixed el elicity sector, you have to be careful. And that's where like, uh, the survival of the algebra, it's, it's in nature. I'm just curious, like this discussion is based on pure Einstein, right? So if you want to extend it to matters or higher derivative corrections, do you see it? Matter, you can introduce matter. Yeah, we actually, in the paper with, the, uh, with Lorambo, we divide the same equation from Siemens. With matter, it's not a problem to include matter. It's just uh, uh, so matter will this uh, symmetric group change like this? Uh, no, because the, um, there would be just extra contribution to the hard part of the charges, but uh, it should, it would, it should not affect the, I mean, it doesn't do, it doesn't affect the algebra for the spin zero, spin one, and I don't think it would for the highest spin contributions. Now, the issue of a higher derivatives, uh, that, um, okay, what I can say about that is that we don't expect any modification um, to the, at least for, for the mass loss formulas or for the spin zero and the spin one, uh, I think there are results in the literature where people claim that there are no corrections coming from higher derivatives to the Einstein equations. Now for uh, uh, sublinear orders, that's like, or, for, or for the spin two, for instance, we don't know. However, what people did is to classify all the possible operator that can uh, bring correction to this soft theorems. So they, they, people classify the kind of operators that modify the sublinks of theorems and the sub sublinks of theorems. And they're all operators which involve some kind of matter. So in that sense, in, uh, the presence of matter could uh, bring some modification to the equation uh, in the sub sublinks of theorems. The subleading one, I don't think is modified. I think it's only the sub sub leading contribution of theorem that is modified by these operators, and, and, but they require the existence of a, a Dilaton field or uh, yes, yeah, some. I mean, not standard matter, like uh, it has to be a Dilaton field or some, some other exotic matter. So, in, for standard matter, I think there should be no modification up, up to the sub sub leading of theorem. Uh, so the whole discussion here is based on Minkowski. So would you remind us what's going, what goes wrong with ADS versus DS? Um, well, people have studied the symmetry groups associated to uh, uh, the seat or the seat. The problem is that it's hard to do uh, the, the scattering amplitude side. It's very complicated. So people don't really know how to do this matrix in uh, the seat space, uh, the seat space. And that's where the correspondence is. I mean, from the symmetry point of view, you can study the, the you can do study the symmetry group, you can study the Einstein equations, uh, but then you don't know how to match, what to match it with. That's the, the missing part there. So in a way it could be, okay, you can take 
the gravity science, okay, that's what, you know, the soft term should look like uh, within, uh, in Zetas or in Zeta space time, but um, yeah, that's the problem basically. Is there any question from online audience? If not, then let's thank the speaker.